My name is Anthony Fatsies and welcome to the What The Finance podcast, where we interview finance, trading and investing experts to help you understand current market trends and learn about the intricacies of new and existing assets. If you enjoy the podcast and to help with the YouTube algorithm, please like, comment and subscribe. It really helps with the podcast and that means we can continue to get amazing guests. Thanks again. And I hope you enjoy. I'd just like to welcome everyone. So obviously, my name is Anthony. I'm from the Warwick Trading Society. I'm the president. Uh, and I'd like to welcome Dr. Adi Imsarovic as well, who's our guest speaker today. And the event is in collaboration with the Oxford Finance Society, uh, King's College London Economics and Finance Society, um, as well as the Leeds Uni- University Union Trading Investment Society and the What the Finance podcast. Uh, so it will be recorded and it will be posted on the What the Finance YouTube and uh, podcast channels. And I'll share that with everyone. So don't stress about that. Um, so Addy, he has over 30 years experience uh, in the oil trading industry and has held a number of senior positions. So that included the global head of oil at Gazprom Marketing and Trading, director of Petrico and the head of their Singapore office and regional manager of Texaco Oil Trading for Asia. He's also taught uh, uh, economics at Surrey University and energy economics and resource and environmental economics. And he's recently, he's released the book, uh, which is Trading and Price Discovery, Discovery for Crude Oils, Growth and Development of the International Oil Markets, which is there. And I found it really useful. It's like a whole history of the markets, as well as sort of how, you know, what, what's happened recently in 2020, all the way back to, I think it's 1850, which is when it started, which is super interesting. So Adi, thank you so much, so much for joining. And just my first question, um, if you look back to the start of your career 30 years ago, what attracted you to the oil markets and to become an oil trader? Thank you very much, uh, Anthony. First of all, it's a great pleasure and privilege to be there. Lots of societies. Uh, I see I'm a trader. I've been a trader all my life. And what I'll try and do, obviously, this book has a sort of a theoretical aspect and so on, a historical aspect, but I'll try to switch it to trading as much as possible because at least half of the book is to do with, with, with the workings of the current um, of contemporary oil markets. You know, um, careers, yeah, it's a great question. I mean, uh, careers, in, in most of our case, you guys will see it, you're, you're right there, you know, most of your listeners are there in terms of careers. It, it, it's something that kind of just, just happens. Um, when I was in my graduate school, I was doing masters in my mid, mid 80s, I mean, oil was all the rage, it, it really was sort of a sexy subject. And I was, um, and I decided to do my masters at um, Surrey University, because at the time that was the place where all the energy sort of oil related stuff was happening. So the head of the department was Colin Robinson. There was one of my uh, favorite uh, teachers, Graham Bird and, and Dr. Paul Stevens, who was my supervisor. Um, and it was a whole bunch of great, interesting people just, just producing papers on oil all the time. And because the market was so volatile, like gas is for most of your listeners right now, that, that was, I just got me sucked in completely. And of course, my first part, very early part of my career is like what will you probably guys will do when you sort of leave universities was analyses. I was an analyst for, for a couple of years. And, and then eventually um, you want to put your money where your where you sort of, uh, where, 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 where your thoughts are and, and want to say, okay, this is what I believe. And um, this is where I want to sort of, uh, um, uh, uh, bet the market on. So um, yes, um, it, it's a bit of a coincidence, but you know, I think a lot of it is what was big and hot at the time. Yeah, and I think that's you know, I guess we're seeing that as well. There's a focus on trading as well, investing in finance and everything like that. That we're probably all seeing these big Bitcoin these days, right? Yeah, exactly, crypto and all that stuff. So um, one thing that as as well that we've seen is there's been like a you could say a disconnect. Uh, to you know what we think of oil and how much it actually affects our lives and how relevant it is uh, to our lives. So, how, how important would you say the oil markets are to sort of the everyday running of society? Yeah, that's another another really direct hit. Thank you. I think like <laughs> the big question is like it's just so important. It's just incredible. Um, and I think I just want to link it to something a lot bigger now to these higher gas prices, higher uh, pump prices, and everything else. I, I, I am totally green. I'm committed to green energy. I think we need to make this green transition ASAP. As, as, and I talk about it in my last chapter of the book and the epilogue. I think we have to do that, but it's not going to happen overnight. It's not going to happen overnight. Um, IEA, International Energy Agency, says uh, in their um, uh, net zero um, uh, forecast or what is called net zero um, kind of roadmap, they're saying we don't need any more investments in future 
oil, uh, oil in particular, but it doesn't say that we don't need it for the current production because one thing that you know your listeners probably don't 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 know is that the, the existing wells, if you don't invest any money in them, they actually decline by on average six seven percent per year. All the wells fifteen percent, maybe even twenty, you know, younger wells less. So if you don't invest money, they go away. Anything from your laptop to to your toothpaste, uh, your car, anything your shoes you're wearing comes from carbohydrate. Uh, carbo from carbon related sort of uh, fossil fuels, I'm afraid. So oil in particular, uh, petrochemical industry is hugely important. So we do have a long way to go. Um, we, we do have to be a little bit patient. So all this talk about let's shut everything now, let's don't do anything now, sounds really, really good, but we have to be realistic. We have to make this transition as painless as possible because otherwise, we see we will, we're risking our elderly people not having enough gas at home to, for heating and so on. We really, really have to be a little bit smart about that. Yeah, and you can say this year, especially throughout you know the UK and Europe, we've seen that with the gas shortages and everything like that. Um, so you recently released an article and you mentioned how basically what you said there, most governments, they're focusing on sort of the supply side and limiting the supply of actual fossil fuels and oil. Um, do you see this focus leading to sort of higher volatility in the oil market and greater potential for supply shocks, maybe like we've seen, you know, over the past few months in gas? And Well, I mean, it's, it's a great segue to, to what, what I've just said. It's, it's, it's exactly that, that point, because policy is everything. And when it comes to energy, policy is absolutely everything. But policy has to be smart policy, not just policy. And this is what my book really goes on and on about governments getting involved in, in, in things that they shouldn't get involved where things are working just fine and actually not getting involved where they need to get involved. The, the point is, it's just so easy to, 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 to ban drilling on, on, on federal land. Obviously I'm right now, uh, you know, I, 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 if I was American, I would have voted for Biden, no, no doubt about that. But he's been hugely disappointing uh, a political left in the US just don't seem to get the economics that you can't ban pipelines by ban sort of drilling on federal land and so on and then go and ask OPEC to give you more oil. It just doesn't make sense. The, the, the reason is when you're bashing on the supply side, this is basic economics. You're bashing on the supply side and you're leaving demand unrestricted. What tends to happen that you have a lot more demand than supply. Guess what happens to prices? Surprise, surprise, we've got shortages and all sorts of uh, bottlenecks and issues. What we need to do, we have to have a balanced transition where we actually put some pressure on demand because demand really matters. It's not good enough to tell BP and Shell, no, you just, just leave the stuff in the ground. And they go like, yeah, but people are queuing at the petrol stations. You know, we really have to be realistic about it, ideology, you know, Fine, I don't mind anyone, anyone's ideology, but we really have to make this transition painless so that everything continues to function until we move on to more cleaner energies. Uh, and especially right now, we have a problem. We also, climate change is actually creating further bottlenecks. It seems, and as I mentioned in that article, it seems that because of climate change, we, we, we're seeing less wind. Again, intermittency problem. We have more hurricanes. Again, you know, problems with, you know, we have to shut US Gulf, a major supplier, they have to shut all their production. Uh, refineries all based in US Gulf where the uh, latest uh, hurricane Ida hit. So, you know, pipelines are there. We have, we, 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 you know, forest fires. We have all sorts of problems that are really impacting that, that, that sort of uh, industry. And now, in the old days, if you remember guys, uh, and Anthony, you know, in the energy, if you're following, I think you do, we used to have this uh, geopolitical premium because oil mainly came from sort of troubled parts of the world. So we have that extra premium, there might be a war, whatever. Now we're moving to another world. We're having a premium on, 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 on the uh, climate related events. You know, next year, almost certainly we'll have at least as many hurricanes and God knows what's gonna happen next. So. We really have to uh, keep that in mind and, and sort of weatherproof our systems, energy systems, uh, as much as we can. Yeah, and I think those are really good points. I would say um, welcome everyone else who's come uh, since we started. And if you have any questions, just put them in the chat uh, and I'll ask them. Uh, you know, I have lots of good questions, but I'd be happy to ask yours as well. So 
you know, you mentioned these issues and, you know, what, what mm. other things can these governments do? What can they, you know, is there anything they can do to accelerate away from oil and further adoption? You know, I know nuclear is a big thing that they're talking about as well. What other suggestions would you have? You know, Anthony, I think, I think you know, I would like to see, I think the best solution for the energy markets, in the, obviously policy is very, very important, but I think it's, it's, we should let the markets work uh, I'm, I'm really, in my book, I talk about it. When you pick the winners, you really have a lot of uh, a danger lurking. So, for example, in the sort of after the First World War, the post-colonial governments, uh, especially of the European countries, UK, France, and so on, the United States, um, they, they put a lot of pressure and they picked their winners. And what did we get as, as a result? We got monopolies. We got seven sisters that monopolized the market and run that monopolized market in a way they wanted, they saw fit. The, the danger that we have now in, in, the, uh, in energy transition is that if the governments pick their winners again, instead of having big oil, we may actually having, have end up with whatever you call it, big green. You know, again, a bunch of companies that, that are running the market and monopolies are just generally not good for business. I mean, monopolies are associated with high prices and, 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 and worse services. And we want to have competition, competition from all sorts of uh, energies. If, 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 if the government, say, if the Brussels picks on offshore wind or if Biden picks on offshore wind and solar, well, how about geothermal? How about all sorts of small scale nuclear reactors? So what we need to do instead of letting government pick and solve things for us, what the governments need to do is to set up a framework, a market framework within which these new energy systems are going to work. And the best way to do it, and this is where I find the Biden administration so disappointing, is that, well, the first thing for goodness sake is have a carbon tax. You have to put a price on carbon. If you don't have a price of carbon, you can't even begin to solve the problem of climate change. And I'll tell you why. You know, we've been talking about, um, carbon sequestration, okay, for years and years and years. And people say, oh, it doesn't work. It's, it's, not, it's not economical. Well, how on earth is going to be, do you have a system economical where you actually build, let's call it 50 or $500 million plant that's you, whose only job is to put carbon into the ground? Where's the revenue coming from? So you need to get the revenue from somewhere. So unless you have price on carbon, none of these things are going to work. And, and you're not going to help the, the new technologies that are clean until you put a price of carbon. So I think that's the, that's the thing, number one. Number two thing, of course, there's now a number of other issues. I think IMF had a couple of good papers on that. You really need to, that's not enough. Absolutely agree. You have to go on sector by sector approach. For example, you have, I mean, you all guys study in economics, sort of uh, various sort of um, uh, in, impediments and issues in the market. Um, and, and one of them is, is the fact that, for example, you will have, you, you're not going to build electric vehicles unless you have charging stations. And nobody's gonna ch build charging stations unless they know they're gonna be vehicles. So it's a bit, bit of a conundrum, uh, catch 22 um, uh, uh, information um, um, asymmetry. So the governments have to step in and basically say, okay, we're gonna spend 500, $500 million and, and, and build these uh, charging stations. So these are the other next step of policies that, that we need to come, but, but I'll start with the basics, low, low hanging fruit, you know, set a price on carbon, make sure that people just don't waste energy. Yeah, definitely. You can say that's been quite successful. Well, I know it's been implemented in Europe as well, and it's been the carbon market has been quite successful. Oh, would you say, or would you say they've there's things? Well, it's been that? really successful in the last uh, in the last, I'd say, probably five years. Uh, for a long period of time, I used to complain it was very unsuccessful because they they they, they put a framework, but the politicians, as they normally do, they would like just you know, uh, for you guys in economics, you know, carbon market ETS reminds you very much of money supply. If, if, if you print these allowances and give them away for free, what was going to happen with their price? They were down, of course. So we had five, seven euro price for years and years and years, and it was completely meaningless um, until we got, I mean, now we're going to, got some, we're getting some meaningful price between 50 and 100 US dollars a, a, a ton. I think it's probably something that is actually making a serious 
impact on the market. I think the next step, and this is where Europe get criticized a lot by their trading partners, quite wrongly, is that you need to put some sort of trade barriers because if you're running a refinery in Greece, what on earth are you going to do when you have to pay the carbon tax of, 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 of 66 euros a ton and your competitor in the Middle East doesn't? And, and, and somebody just imports the product. So obviously you have to put those barriers and that will, but that will inevitably uh, uh, change. That's really interesting. So that's sort of like, uh, you know, trade tariffs for bringing energy and, and other resources into the European economy to, as you said, make Euro- European companies more competitive. It's inevitable. It's, it's absolutely inevitable, but that's, it's okay. I mean, you know, this COP26 has been, I, I think, you know, not as successful as we hoped, but more successful than, you know, I feared. Um, and I think we've made some decisions. Uh, I think we probably, um, with, with commitment that we have right now, and the, the whole idea of Paris actually is, I think, you know, a lot of people don't understand the COP26 you know, and, and, and the whole Paris Agreement where it all came from. Um, it, it just, there's no such thing as international law. You can't tell the United States you have to do that. Nobody can do that. Okay, so the only way you can do it, and this is where Paris, I think, was a breakthrough, is for the United States to make a commitment, go to their own Congress or whatever UK to go to their own Parliament and say, these are our commitments, let's make it into legislation. And then it does become legal obligation. Of course, you know, as a state, it's not always happens, but, you know, it generally is probably at the international level the best way we can do these things. Otherwise, we'll end up with Kyoto, where everyone committed to everything, and then they all said, well, not really, I don't want to do that. So um, I, I, I know I, I sympathize with a lot of people who are um, disappointed with, 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 with uh, COP26, but you know what, this is the best we have at the international level, and it, it, it is a slow process, and I am optimistic. I think people are realizing that, you know, going ahead with coal, let's say India, India today shut some coal power plants because they couldn't breathe in Delhi. You know, you know they will realize that. And they can say as much as they want, yes, you want to burn more coal because it's our right, and maybe it is, but eventually um, it's, it, it is what it is. You, you have to worry about the health of your people, your population, and the general situation, including Middle Eastern countries. You know, I was at a conference uh, a few weeks ago where, you know, a lot of people say, well, you know, in the Middle East, we still have to rely on, you know, fossil fuels and oil and that. You know what? You saw scorching temperatures this summer in, in most of the Middle East. People, you can't survive out there without aircon. And you know what? Give it another 20, 30 years, a lot of those places will be flooded. Something has to give. Um, and and, and, and I'm, I'm very hopeful that we will make the right decisions, but those decisions will have to come from sort of learning from the history of the oil industry not allowing monopolies to tell us what they do, but let competition, free market, new uh, sources of fuel come up. Uh, new, I think demand, demand response is actually, I think, a big, big deal as well that very few people talk about. You know, as we, we have electricity prices in the UK now, at times uh, exceeding 2,000 uh, pounds per megawatt hour. You know, it, we, uh, we as retailers don't see that. Which just tells you, I mean, you're an economist, how can you have retail market completely divorced from the wholesale market? Nobody has, I don't have any incentive to switch off my washing machine, even though the, the, the price of electricity is 2,000 pounds. It's crazy. That doesn't make sense. We have to fix that. Yeah, and I think we've seen that maybe throughout Europe and some companies where it's more like uh, it's not fixed rates <clears> of electricity, but I think people are really starting to feel that, the, uh, the increase of the costs. Um, but you mentioned something there about sort of monopolies and cartels. And I guess, you know, through your book, reading it, you know, over the whole history of oil, there's been these cartels and monopolies from Standard Oil, you know, to the big seven, you mentioned there, Seven Sisters, and now OPEC Plus. You know, how has this impacted the efficiency of the markets? And, you know, do you think we're coming to the end or is it still a massive issue that these companies? No, I think, I think uh, okay, uh, OPEC Plus, um, I think the fact that uh, OPEC is the elephant in the room of the oil market. Uh, and we try, we, we, we need as a lesson from the oil market, have to, to avoid the, the situation where we have these big elephants in the room. But anyway, they are, they are. And I think, you know, I, I'm not being unkind to OPEC because 
I think that they played a fundamentally important role for the developing nations because, you know, up until, you know, 70s, the, the, the market was post-colonial, basically, and the big oil companies were running them. So the only thing that OPEC did, I think that the key legacy of OPEC is to reclaim that control and the ownership of their, of their own resources. Now, you know, OPEC after 1980s has been an elephant in the room, but really have given up most of, of, of their powers of, of market pricing um, uh, to, to sort of free markets. So I, th I think um, the, the fact that OPEC put together this alliance of OPEC plus, if anything, actually, I, I think, and I know it's a very controversial view, I think it actually betrays the weakness of OPEC because OPEC cannot control the market themselves. OPEC, I mean, we have, let's say, uh, 2019 oil demand, and now we're actually approaching it again. It's close to about 100 million barrels a day. OPEC produces about, at the moment, about 28. That's not enough to control the market. And that's why they have this alliance of OPEC+. Plus. The problem with OPEC+, Plus because it's an, it's an alliance of countries that are so different, so diverse, have very different political, um, economic, resource views. I mean, Russia said many times, no, we, we don't want terribly high prices because we want uh, people still to um, use this, you know, our oil for years to come. Saudis are the same. A number of other countries are the opposite. So I think, I think it would be very hard to keep that cohesion um, as soon as we see another, another fall in demand. But, you know, um, uh, forecasting in oil is a bit of a fool's game, to be honest with you. <laughs> Yeah, I'm sure lots of people have lost money trying to do that. And I guess you could say the only control they have is being able to saturate the market, like we saw at the start of 2020, and maybe you know driving the price down. But it's, it's hard that, to. That's push an easy up. one, um, yeah. exactly. And I and I think you know there, there's been so many for, for students of uh, the oil industry, so many different models of OPEC behavior. Um, the the simple truth is number one from my research, in different times. There's been different OPEC follow different models. And lesson number two is that probably the, the, the best model applicable for the last 20 years has been limit pricing model. You can find it in the energy economics uh, book by Bhattacharya. It's not his model or anything, it just nicely presents it. But it's, it's just a model where, you know, uh, a big cartel so, such as OPEC and with a big sort of leader like Saudi Arabia, they allow somebody to produce, even though they have much higher marginal cost of production. But at some stage, if they see their, their share of the market being threatened, they go into the offensive and, and the price war. And we see this price war has, has happened several times, uh, and it happens every roughly 30 years, where they basically say, look, you know, find your place, be a lot lower cost producer, we'll take our market share. And that's why it's taking such a long time for shale, I think, to come back, because, you know, Last year was a big shock for shale. It was a massive shock for any high cost producer. Negative yeah. oil prices, negative oil prices are very, very, I, I actually dedicated one chapter to that. It's a, it's a very, really interesting period. Um, yeah, but I found it quite interesting because you mentioned it's quite, it's happened before in gas, I think is something you mentioned. So it's not like it's unheard of in commodities. It's happened before, but I think people were just so unexpected about it happening. No, absolutely. I mean, <clears throat> commodities are, are storable things. So you have to understand that. And, and actually, if you, if you look at metals, um, you'll see that now they have a lot of problems at the LME with, with, the, with the inventories and everything. The problem is that <clears throat> the, when the inventory starts filling up, your, 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 your cost is next, you know, basically where you're next, what do you, what, basically the, the, the market can fall out of bed or so-called contango can fall out of bed. What, what happened at WTI is particularly interesting and, and negative prices, by the way, happen with Waha uh, on gas. And the reason for that is, is basically that this gas was associated gas, okay? So uh, the oil was the premium product. So you, you're producing oil and gas, and you have no choice, but because you're making so much money on oil, you don't care about the price of gas and that price of gas goes negative. So it's pretty, pretty simple economics, right? What, what happened with WTI is a lot more complex and I think needs to be looked at um, by the authorities because uh, the extent or, uh, to, to which the oil price fell just worries me because it doesn't make any sense, it doesn't make economic sense. Uh, at minus $37 uh, a, a barrel, 
you could store that oil and deliver it next month. In fact, you could put on a truck, drive it around the United States and then deliver it and still make loads of money. So why it happened is, is not 100% clear, I think. Yeah, I think you said it's. Uh, they did a report on it and you weren't too happy with the results either. It, it didn't really No, I mean, there. it took them a very long time to produce a report. A report was really lackluster. It was like, oh yeah, the usual things. We are approaching very high levels of um, <clears throat> storage, inventory. Yeah, so what? We didn't hit the tank tops. Um, there was no issues with, with storing. And even if there was, you could store oil at Houston and deliver it next month and still make like $25 a barrel. Which is un unheard of. <laughs> that would be a pretty good trade. Absolutely. Um, well, it was. A lot of people made lots of money. Yeah, and I guess you can link it to maybe there was a few traders who just had no idea. They had did not want to collect it whatsoever. So they were just trying to dump yeah, it. At, yeah. yeah, but um, so we, ha we have a question from Velen. So uh, again, uh, so he mentioned about CO2 emission certificates. So do you think that CO2 emission certificates will fundamentally change the energy markets? So, you know, will all countries have to implement it or is it okay if maybe, you know, just the U Europe and UK and the US implement them as well? Uh, well? Well, I think they're going to make a, a, a big difference. As I said, having a price on carbon is absolutely essential to having uh, this energy transition. Now, I think what, what, whether everyone has to have it, no. Uh, I think what we need to do is have the key players, uh, which is Europe, United States and China. China already has, um, has, a, has a carbon trading system. Parts of the United States, including California, have it. Canada has it, but the United States still lacking. I think it's absolutely essential to set that price on carbon to give you the incentive. Because if you are if you're a new technology, how do you beat these incumbents? How do you beat oil? How do you beat gas? The only way to 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 beat them is to make sure that they actually pay for the the, the damage they cause. And you're saying, look, I'm not. Let, let's face it, Tesla makes most of their money and has been making have they been making most of the uh, their money through uh, carbon certificates because they're clean, their cars are clean. They actually, they, they collected millions of dollars. So I, I think it's absolutely essential. Will this be um, uh, the sort of a game changer? I think it will, but is that enough? I don't think so. I think there are lots of other policies that we have to put in place to make sure that we, we have this uh, clean energy transition from gas and oil. I think low-hanging fruit are still there to be exploited. I mean, we're, we're spending a lot of time at the Oxford Institute for Energy Studies, where I work with the carbon methane emissions. I mean, that's crazy. Methane, methane is, is natural gas. Natural gas is very expensive. So why do people waste it um, through, through leak, leakages? Uh, now, we also have good technology to, to, to find those leakages. We also have a number of satellites going around that actually pinpoint where the leakages are happening. So we have to stop this. And the way one way to, st to stop it is to internalize the externalities, to make sure that those guys who actually uh, are emitting that either have to shut in their production or, or pay very high penalties or, or something, but, but that really needs to be internalized one way or the other. By the way, it's getting dark here. Give me a second to switch the light on. Yeah, that's fine, Sorry. no problem. <laughs> and he's in Bosnia, so I think it's quite... It's getting dark. Yeah, I'm in Europe, so uh, European <laughs> time, so it's getting dark here early. So I apologize about that. No, that's fine. No problem. Uh, so Miles has actually asked, uh, what is the title of your book and where can I purchase it from? So you might want to plug it and show it again. <laughs> well, absolutely. Um, it's, um, yeah, this is it. Sort of uh, trading and price discovery for crude, crude oils. Um, it's, it's, I'll, I'll, t I'll give you just an idea what, what it's about. It's, it's Palgrave, it's on Amazon, you can buy it on Palgrave. It's not just that, I think, I, I think the idea is that with a book, it started with the fact that I, I've been asked a lot and I've written a lot of papers on the workings of contemporary oil markets. Now, contemporary oil markets, I think it's very important for you young guns, I think it's very important to explain. You saw the um, you know, <clears throat> uh, WTI going negative. The, the, the main victims were ETS, the guys who actually didn't really read what's on the tin. When you, read, when you trade a contract, you have to know what's going on. Some contracts like WTI, in particular Brent contract, is very, very complex. It's complex because of its history. And that's why, so I started writing a book about the workings of the international oil market, and then realized, look, um, I can't really explain it unless I go to a little bit of history. 
So I went back to, and, and that's why you get a sort of historical part of, 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 and if you don't want to read it, that's fine. But the idea is that, you know, you having read the book, you really understand how the international markets work um, and, and why certain prices are the way they are. And, and they are fast changing as well. Um, we, we're getting involved in some further changes in, in some of the benchmarks. And, and I think the book is probably a very good introduction for any young guns who want to trade energy in general uh, to sort of uh, find, find their bearings. Yeah, perfect. Thank you. Um, and so Nicholas, he is asked, uh, he's talking about negative oil again, uh, which is obviously we've already mentioned. So do you think this could happen? W would this be possible to happen again? Or do you think it was just COVID, the pandemic, de demand shock, all those sort of things like uh, you've mentioned it before? Uh, the, the, there's one big problem um, in, in, in the oil market with derivatives. And that's why I think Warren Buffett um, sort of referred to, Warren Buffett never particularly liked derivatives. I think with, with all due respect to Warren Buffett, um, and I should, and I do have a massive respect for him, I think he was wrong. Derivatives are extremely useful, but anything like anything that's useful, you know, a car is very useful, but cars kill people. Doesn't mean we should ban cars, right? Um, <clears throat> I think that the issue in the oil markets is now derivatives are becoming so big in reference to the, um, and I talk about this in the book, the so-called leveraging, in reference to the actual physical base that if you that if you get a situation where some party can have a massive that derivatives position on a small physical base they can actually make this leveraged impact on the market and i think it, this definitely needs more regulation I, i'm not a big fan of regulation whatsoever but in some some instances where the market simply you know can't be self controlled you, you need somebody to step in and, and do that. And I think that was probably one of the issues with uh, clearly some traders made a lot of money out of, um, um, out of negative WTI because, because it, it, there was a lot of market inefficiencies. Uh, these ETS um, uh, uh, funds grew so big as a part of the WTI contract, and, and, and now they are part of some other contracts. That, and they were also announcing their um, um, positions, entering and exiting positions up in advance. Now, when they were small, it wasn't a big deal, but if it's like telling somebody, telling your friend, look, you know, or, or it's like Elon Musk telling somebody, I'm just gonna sell like half of my Tesla shares. I mean, it's crazy. What are they going to do? They'll probably front run you, they'll do something. They may take some derivative position on the basis of that. And it seems to me, by looking at the data, uh, WTI at the time, what happened again, this is all just smoking gun, uh, no conclusive evidence at this stage, because I don't have access to the evidence, was that there were massive, massive positions on derivatives at so-called um, trading on close. Um, and somebody actually bought a lot of oil at the close and had a very uh, was highly incentivized to have that close as low as possible. And it was pretty low. Yeah, well, that's super. And as you said, it's like it gets to the point where there's multiples of the amount of paper oil than there is of actual oil. And that's where- Exactly. It and that, that's the danger. And that's something that really uh, needs to be looked at. Yeah. Do, do you think that would be possible though? Because I guess the issue is it's similar to- you know, we got to look at COP26. It's all international. All these markets are international. So no, 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 no. Um, 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 Anthony, it is quite possible because the two biggest oil. I mean, I'm talking about oil now, but it's, it's the same with all the exchanges. It's like you've got two major exchanges. You've got CME in the United States with primarily WTI, and they all have everything. And you've got ICE, Internet, Internet, International uh, Exchange, Intercontinental Exchange, with their brand contract. They, they can monitor, and they do have actually some rules where they monitor towards the expiry who has what size positions. And they should be monitoring those positions to make sure that not no one party has exerts an undue influence over the contract. And I think it's the duty of all the exchanges and, and those um, uh, who actually supervise the exchanges. And so exchanges are heavily supervised. So it's doable. Okay, perfect. That would be pretty interesting to see if it happens in the future. So um, if, if anyone else has questions, as I said, put them in the chat. But um, for, for, say, people who are interested in trading oil, commodities in general, and they haven't done it before, um, maybe apart from your book, where would you recommend they, they go and learn? And is there anyone you recommend they listen to? Or what would be the resources they could, they could go to? Well, if, if you're interested, first of all, um, this is what I used to tell my students. I think, you know, oil is, is still sexy and will be for quite some time. 
oil is not a growing industry. So I, I would warn you probably against going into oil uh, simply because it's not growing, it's not expanding. I think natural gas, uh, LNG in particular, is interesting. My personal favorite, even though at my uh, sort of uh, advanced age would be if I was to start now to look at power, I think power has a long way to go. For the reason I told you earlier on, I think there's so many inefficiencies in that market. I mean, there's no retail market, doesn't reflect wholesale market and so on. So in the UK, we had 20 odd companies go out of business because they didn't know even how to hedge themselves or they didn't want to, or they were just hunting the market. So um, <clears throat> um, in, in, in terms of what, what you want, what, what you'd like to read, uh, apart from my own book, I'll tell you, um, I, I, I wish, I don't know if I can send you maybe just the biography or and maybe you put it on your website or something from, from my book because, you know, Morris Edelman is my hero. I think he's the guy who wrote all the best things about oil ever. He was um, uh, Emeritus Professor. Eventually, I, I had a pleasure of meeting here at the MIT. Uh, in Cambridge, Massachusetts. And I think he's the guy who probably wrote some of the best pieces um, on, on oil. Um, but, you know, I, I'm quite happy to send you some sort of uh, um, sort of reading list uh, that people can pick. Uh, but unfortunately, there's not much recent. Um, uh, if you want to read purely on the Brent market history of the Brent market, I think you've got Robert Marbro. This, these are my guys from, this is legacy. And I'm so proud to be part of the uh, Oxford Energy Institute because these are guys, Robert Marbro, Paul Horsnell, they wrote uh, books on uh, Brent market, two books. Uh, Horsnell wrote another book on, uh, on the Asian market. They are out of date. Uh, that's, that's, that's a big problem. And that's one of the reasons uh, for my book as well, to bring it. And I heavily rely on, on the sort of their data and their research as well. So, but they'll be looking at, and just look at it, go into the Oxford Energy Institute uh, publications. You've got free downloads for a number of papers on oil, gas, electricity, and so on. We have a number of programs. So feel free to download them and they're very, very current and there are some, some excellent podcasts. So I, I hope that, that that will help. Yeah, definitely. I'm sure there'll be so much information that we can look at. So what is actually the, like the goals of the institution? So obviously, it seems like there's lots of very smart people working there like yourself. You know, what, what are your goals? What do you aim to do? Well, it's, it's you know, Oxford Energy Institute is, is, is a registered charity. So um, it's not a, it's a non-profit institution um, committed to um, um, originally started by Robert Marbro with, with oil and gas. Uh, and then obviously now has expanded a lot into huge on gas, LNG, our gas and LNG uh, team are massive. We have power team. It's essentially just um, an academic provision of, of, of you know, information, um, not, not different, but obviously on a very different scale and different approach to International Energy Agency. It's just a, a registered charity there for the industry. We have a bunch of sponsors. Uh, the sponsors sponsor the institute and we basically do research where we see fit. We still have a lot of liberty there as far as I understand. So nobody tells us what to do, which is a wonderful thing to do when you're an academic. So you can put around, read whatever you want and write some papers about something that nobody cares about, even though we do try and be as topical as we can. Yeah, that's super interesting. So like, and as you said there, the, um, the focus is trying to, you know, get interesting things about energy and about the future and what and what would you say you're most interested in at the moment well i'm, I'm, I'm you know generally in my forte has always been uh, oil because i started um, and, and and finished my sort of career trading oil but in the meantime i also spent a lot of time at, at, at gas from marketing and trading um looking at gas gas as well as lng because a lot of gas and lng are still priced off uh, oil especially in the Far East, in Japan, there's something called um, Japanese crude cocktail or JCC, where, you know, those lucky enough right now to price it of oil are probably getting some very, very cheap gas, but also in Europe. Um, and gas has been very exciting, but I think the whole idea of energy transition came to me from my teaching. I, you know, I finished about five years ago. So I did read, I was teaching environmental and resource economics for about six, seven years at Surrey University. And in the process, as you always do with students, actually, you learn a lot, not just teach. You actually, process of teaching is, is a big process of learning, which, which I'm really excited about, because you always get questions you can't answer and you go back and it's like, what about? 
So um, uh, I really enjoy that. And, and, and that got me really interested in this whole idea of energy transition, not least because of the fact that it's probably the most burning problem that we have um, in the world right now. We really have to get this energy transition done and not just get it done, but done it in probably the most efficient, as we say in economics, i.e. the cheapest possible way. Yeah, definitely. That's super interesting. You mentioned Gazprom there, which is obviously uh, marketing training, which you were uh, the head of Global Oil. So can you maybe explain your role there and, you know, what, what were you doing and, uh, you know, how was that? Because I guess it's, it's quite a topical company at the moment as well with what's happening. You know, I guess there's, uh, you well, know, everyone's got yeah, their own. You have to be careful. It. I mean, it's like, you know, Anthony's like, I work at Gazprom Marketing Training. It's, it's a UK company, uh, oh. which eventually is wholly owned by Gazprom Germany, Germania, and then eventually gas from uh, mothership so it, it was a uk company so he had a very very strict way of dealing with things um as, as any other uk company um you know my job is pretty much to um look after uh, that my main job was to look after our portfolio of food and products and then to also look after the portfolio anything that had oil to do oil pricing with it as, uh, as I said, I think it was very, very interesting because uh, massive volumes of gas and, and, and um, LNG are still priced on, on, on our own basis. So we had to make sure that that's all hedged. And, and what, what's exciting in, in the oil market prior to my career at industrial marketing trading, um, most of the oil market involvement was usually about 12 months forward with a heavy emphasis on the next three months. Uh, with, with gastro marketing training, because of the gas, we we're really doing stuff like five, 10 years out, which is really exciting and interesting. So very often at that far out, you're actually discovering markets. You are a part of the market discovery because nothing happens until you put a bid and suddenly there's an offer, you know, and, and, and you actually, essentially, you are creating a market from scratch, which is kind of quite exciting. That's amazing because obviously the, the oil market is very volatile. So looking that far ahead, like I'm sure it'd be very challenging. Well, it is, but you know, the, you know, oil. That's a, that's a, you know, oil is a very efficient market. It's, it's the most mature. That that's one of the reasons I wrote the book. It's I think if if you discuss the most mature market commodity market in the world, it, you you basically can draw a lot of lessons from that. But forward curves are very, very good. Um, you know, again, you know, far from perfect 10 years out, but, you know, up to five years out, oil curves in, in, in you know, what we call price curves, are actually very, very solid. And, and people, people sort of trade them. The difficulty comes when you try and trade something like dated, for example, to futures or JCC, what I said, Japanese crude cocktail, which is a very complex animal. Uh, in the oil markets, that that's very hard to hedge further out there, and it's that's where all the fun is. That you know what you know. I I I had a whole bunch of young analysts. They they loved it, you know, trying to get the curves right and work it out. And it's it's part of that discovery that what that makes it quite interesting, actually. Yeah, definitely, that's super interesting. So um, we've got another question from Velen. Uh, so thank you, Velen. You <laughs> got a few questions. So if you were to invest today, with uh, would you go compressed natural gas or LNG? It's interesting. Oh, compressed natural gas or LNG? Well, I think LNG is clearly has been the future. If you look at the rates of growth of natural gas and, and even application in sort of retail markets, I think LNG uh, is, is by clearly the leader. Um, I think LNG is, is, you know, when LNG first came out, it was, it was more seen as a sort of a particular kind of natural gas, particular commodity. But right now, especially in Europe, and everything is happening with, with Russia and, and Nord Stream 2 and everything, natural gas, uh, LNG is just natural gas, it's just in another form, okay? It's, it's just liquefied natural gas at, at minus 160, whatever, one degree Celsius. So if, if there's not enough gas coming from Russia, you can bring LNG. Um, uh, so it's basically, we're talking about the same commodity and, and LNG has been fantastic in actually commoditizing the gas market. Gas market, I remember when I was at university and even much, much later, it was everyone said natural gas market is a segregated market. And these are the sort of main segregated markets. They're supplied by pipelines or bilateral contracts between different countries. Nothing like that anymore. Uh, Russia is a good example again where 
if the LNG prices are low, everyone says, well, I don't want to buy that. It's too high. And LNG has been the key of the price discovery for the, um, for the gas market. So in any market in the world, <clears throat> it's the marginal, we call it marginal barrel because it's for oil, but marginal, whatever, cube for gas, is that marginal uh, barrel or cube that, that actually determines the price. That, that's what, what price is all about, marginal cost equals marginal revenue. And that marginal thing in gas has been LNG, and LNG has been actually setting up the price of gas worldwide, whether pipeline or not. Yeah, and it's quite interesting. I like in your book you mentioned that it wasn't was until the eighties until there was like a sort of oil markets as well that were more international. And I guess as you said there, it wasn't until recently that the the gas market. So it's quite interesting how they're only recently that these markets have come come alive and probably energy as well. well. I- for anyone interested in sort of gas markets, I, I wrote a paper last year with Jonathan Stern from the Oxford Energy Institute, and we did a comparative study of oil and gas markets. So we tried to compare the two, and, and, and actually the, the, the very close comparison. Those of you guys who follow uh, oil markets, you know there's WTI in the United States, there's a Brent in Europe, and there's Dubai in the Far East. Well, hey, surprise, surprise, in the gas markets, you've got Henry Hub in the United States, You've got now TTF uh, in, in Europe, and you've got JKM in Asia. So it's, it's, it's literally following the same patterns. And not just that, the same companies are trading it. And actually, the training, the, the gas LNG trade is actually generally, in most companies, being traded, trained in, um, in oil markets, because oil markets are mature and very complex. And then you, when you take somebody from that training ground and put them into LNG, they go like, oh, this is easy kind of thing, even though the product is actually harder. Uh, because of the shipping and everything else, but in, in terms of so understanding how to set up the, the, the uh, benchmarks, it, it, it all is following on markets. That's why it's very, very important, I think. And that's one of the reasons I wrote this book, because if you study the history of the oil markets, you, you may eventually, I don't even know, I, I know very little about Bitcoin, but eventually get there as well, because it's the history of a market that you pick up the lessons and say, okay, what, what's valid here and how can I apply it? Yeah, and as you said, it's the human psychology, looking to human psychology of the markets and how that will affect future markets. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Perfect. So we've got another question from Christian, who's actually the chairman of the Warwick Trading Society. And he has a pretty interesting uh, experience. He's worked as a power trade in Romania. So he's, he's sort of experienced a lot of the issues that have been, you know, in gas and power and carbon certificates as well. Carbon certificates as well. Um, and his question was, um, how would you recommend that he learns more about power and gas markets? So maybe are there any other resources you recommend for that? Or? Well, that's a tough one. You know what? The, the, the main reason is that power markets are in a state of flux. They're really changing. I mean, I, I had daily meetings with them when I was at Gas from Marketing and Trading with our power guys. Um, and, and then we, we, we had basically um, even algo, algos that traded uh, markets across Europe and so on. I think that's one market that really hasn't been well represented. I mean, you know what? Um, I I strongly suggest have a look at the OIS website because we do have a a power electricity group and see what what you can get on that. One of the reasons is that, firstly, the markets are changing, regulation is changing, and the power mix is changing. Obviously, one of the main reasons why power prices in Europe are so high right now is because of gas prices. Why? We all moved from coal, UK being the best example now, you know, generating almost half of the electricity from coal. And now we moved to gas. And as the gas became tight, you know, we just get, you know, power prices follow gas. Um, to be honest with you, in my, my personal opinion is if, if, if you can get experience that you seem to have got, got had um, work experience in Romania, but get experience in a good company that has a good um, a, a power, a power, power systems, power, power team. Um, they are very intense teams. They trade stuff like half an hour forward for quite a period of time over. They, they do a lot of uh, intense um, modeling of prices. And I think power guys are probably the cutting edge of sort of IT technology as well, as far as uh, um, sort of energy markets are concerned. Unfortunately, as I said, I don't think there's a book you can read through. Um, I think get some papers from the OIS website. And if you can, just get, get, get hold of some traders or analysts, say even better, and just talk to them. I mean, I used to talk to them all the time. And, you know, 
half of them are absolute rocket scientists. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. And um, so you mentioned like uh, trying to get into involved in uh, one of those companies. So do you have any companies that you recommend if someone was looking for a summer internship or a, uh, <laughs> you know, without being, I, I know you won't be able to remember them all or anything like that, but any recommendations? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, look, you can't go wrong with, with, with like company that's from Mark to head, trading head, and I'm still sure they have a very, very good um, a power team, a, younger, a bunch of young young guys, uh, very, very young again. I mean, embarrassingly young for me. Um, I mean, all, all these big, big um, uh, shops like a Jera, like a EDF, uh, and so on. I mean, they all these, you know, big utility companies, they, they, they should have a good power teams. So just look them up. Um, there are plenty of jobs out there. Have a look. Um, and you know what? If you don't get into the power teams, don't always despair. If you want to be in trading, get into any kind of trading you can. And then you can move sideways in a company. Uh, all these companies like, you know, uh, you know, actually, why am I mi missing the big, big majors like VP and Shells of this world? Very, very big, very, very important. And, and you know, they have fantastic. I mean, Shell essentially right now is, is, is a gas company. Since they bought British Gas, they've been a gas company. VP as well has moved, moved to gas as well. So um, these guys, if you can get into their trading programs, traders programs, uh, very hard to get in. If you don't get in, don't 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 be disappointed. You know they probably get ten out of thousand people. Um, something I always used to tell sort of my students uh, at uni. You know they they apply for five jobs and they don't get any, and they go, oh my god, I didn't get any jobs. And no job offers. And I'm like, who did you apply to? Well, I applied for Shell, Morgan Stanley, Goldman Sachs. And I'm like, look, you start guys study stats, do the probabilities. What is your chance of getting a job with Morgan Stanley or, 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 or just pure statistical probability? Add up those five, you still your probability of, of having had an offer or even an interview is probably one in two hundred or something. So you just have to spread your sort of tentacles and 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 increase your work on your probabilities. When it comes to jobs, work on your probability. Make sure that you maximize your probability. You know, I hate to say this, but you know, um, Anthony, I remember when I was a young graduate, I was joked with this guy I won't mention, but he was world famous um, head of trading at Goldman Sachs. He would get these thousands of thousands of uh, applications right on his desk. They would just take a whole bunch and throw them into the bin, and he would say, "I hate unlucky traders." <laughs> so. <laughs> Uh, not nice um, when you are on the other side of it, but you know you see the point. Yeah, and I think with everything, you need that little bit of luck, don't you? <laughs> with you, you need luck. luck, but you you work on your luck. I mean, you've got to increase your probabilities. Go for big companies, go for middle-sized companies, go for startups. You know, sometimes being in a startup may be a great thing. You just don't know. You know, you may end up in a startup that gives you shares, and 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 you end up making tons of money um, within five years. So, you know, look, look at all the options. Yeah, definitely. And I think Christian said he just told that joke to someone the other day. So it's it's obviously yeah. Well, well he's been known. going around for years. It's not it's not a new joke for sure. Yeah, no, definitely. And um, he had another question as well. So it's to do with NS two, uh, which is obviously quite prevalent. So yesterday there was a suspension affair uh, with Germany, sort of stopping it from happening at the moment. Uh, so do you think this will sort of be resolved soon, or what impacts do you think this will have yeah. on the long term? Uh, you know, gas prices in the in Europe. It, it's highly political. When something's highly political, you never know what's going to happen. When when other you know forces get involved, you know, the United States have been involved in, in, in various countries and da da da. Uh, so I don't know. But the, the point is, it's very simple. What what's happened recently is sort of um, um, what, what what Europe is saying. Look, okay, and NS two has to go through the usual sort of legal procedures. Because the, um, the, the energy market in Europe is, is deregulated, when you have a deregulated market, you can't have somebody running a pipeline um, on their own because it's a monopoly. So if somebody has a pipeline, they basically have to offer their pipeline to a number of other players at some reasonable price, or they have to offer access. So what's happening right now was that one of the participants in the, in the market was outside Gazprom, was not, but they obviously have to be entities, European entities as well. They can't be foreign entities, I think. That's my legal understanding. I think that, that this is not a big obstacle to resolving the issue. I think the issue will be resolved. I think there are strong vested interests uh, on all sides. I, I don't know, to be honest with you, I don't buy the fact that NS2 is going to make 
Europe more dependent. It just give, gives Europe more gives Europe more more options. Uh, it's just another route from the same country. Um, so, but it is highly political because of Ukraine. So I don't want to go into politics. That's not my strong side anyway. So I think it will get resolved. It will just be bumpy because it's political, and I, and I hope it gets resolved because it's not very very good timing for Europe right now. They didn't pick up a good time to to sort of uh, you know uh, pick this battle uh, because they are on a sort of weak weak side of it. Um, but it should get resolved soon, and and I think it's in everyone's interest. It's in Russia's interest to supply Europe, the European interest to get supplied by Russia. And it's in Europeans' interest to get supplied by the rest of the world. And I think, you know, especially countries like Germany could do with a few more LNG terminals. But um, as the situation is right now, even if you have more terminals, it wouldn't help you actually get more gas. But it's been a really very unfortunate situation. It's been an utter perfect storm from weather point of view, not just in Europe, but globally. Uh, situation in China, situation with coal uh, and the weather um so it's been it's been it's been a tough one yeah and you could say it might bring you know energy security back to the forefront of a lot of these countries maybe. oh absolutely and and you know this is this is why also energy transition is very important you know, by transitioning to new renewables hopefully will increase our energy security but unfortunately this year it hasn't been the case because we've had less wind so you know that that's been a, a big problem obviously in northwest europe solar even though solar is quite generally complementary with wind power it hasn't, you know, it doesn't work very well in Northwest Europe, but um, we, we do have, I, I think energy transition is definitely coming to the forefront in a different guise. I mean, I, I think energy transition is going to be a very, very interesting issue because if anything, uh, current events are telling us that we need to speed up the energy transition rather than slow it down, even though there are a lot of these voices saying, oh, no, 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 we shouldn't. No, I think, I think we need to speed it up. We need to use more sun. Uh, more wind, no more whatever we can get, not to rely on, on these um, sort of big powers, big pipelines, and so on. Yeah, perfect. I think I definitely agree with that. Um, so, Addy, thank you so much for you know join, joining us today to talk, talk with us. So I think everyone's found it really useful. Um, and I guess my last question, so for young people like us, you know, we're looking to get into the industry, we're looking to, uh, you know, to, to do that. What, what would you think we should take away from this interview? Or, or what would be one message of advice maybe? Well, uh, the, the, the key, I think, the, the key message from the interview is that you have to be commercial. Uh, if you want to have a career in, 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 in something commercial, something that, you know, in, in a company, you have to find a job where you add value. Um, I think we are turning more and more towards markets in, in various forms, from carbon markets to oil and gas markets and so on. If you want to be part of that world, um, I, I think it's a very exciting part of the world and I would strongly encourage you. I would never go back uh, on my career being an old trader pretty much most of my life, but have patience. Have patience, be smart about it. If, you know, be resilient, be very resilient. Um, I have two boys who are a little bit older than you guys um, now working. It, it's amazing. And I know from my own career, how many times you get knocked down, you just have to get up get up and fight and, and find a different way of getting. But if you know what you want, if you know what you like, just, just stick to it and um, you'll get there. Yeah, that's great. It's great advice. And maybe don't take it personally. I think sometimes it's easy to do that. But as you said, just get up and keep going. Absolutely. Perfect. Awesome. So Addy, thanks again for joining us. So I've put the link uh, for anyone who wants to watch us back or if you, uh, you know, want to see the recording, I'll put the link in the, in the chat below. So this will be recorded and put in the what finance podcast. Um, and yeah, and if you'd like to, if anyone wants to buy the book, obviously it's on Amazon, so you can go there. Um, and if anyone wanted to get in contact with you to ask questions, what would be the best way? It's the, um, uh, it's on my, if you go to OIES, just um, Oxford Institute for Energy Studies, Adi Msurik, Adi is fine. You'll get my biography and you'll get uh, my email, which is adi.imsirovic at oxfordenergy.org. Um, um, so um, that's it. And guys, good luck with everything. Uh, it's been a real pleasure, Anthony. Thank you very much. Oh, th thank you so much for coming on. We really appreciate it. Um, but yeah, but as I said, th thanks again. And uh, I hope to talk to you in the future. Thank you so much for listening. And if you enjoyed the episode, please subscribe and click the bell icon so you are notified when new podcasts are released. I hope you're leaving with some great value about investing, trading, and finance. See you on the next show.